Ned Stark's death in Game of Thrones is one of the most shocking moments in television history. Sir Illyn, bring me his head. <laughs> but aside from just shock value, killing off the perceived protagonist in the show's first season propelled Game of Thrones beyond what anyone could imagine. It established the groundwork for tension throughout the series, letting its audience know that this story has very real stakes, and the hero's plot armor we were all so familiar with would not interfere with the story Game of Thrones wanted to tell. Now, if you were familiar with George R. R. Martin's book series A Song of Ice and Fire, which is the source material Game of Thrones very faithfully adapted in its earlier seasons, you knew this was coming. But for many others, this would be the first time they've ever experienced anything like this. And for Game of Thrones, trusting the blueprint established by George R. R. Martin, they replicated the impact from the book and ultimately offered TV audiences the perfect death of a character. Now let's go over why Ned Stark's death worked so well. I want you to think about a handful of components throughout this video. One, are we emotionally invested into this character. Do we find him relatable or do we at least understand his decisions? Basically, is this a fully fleshed out character, whether it's a main character or a supporting character? And two, what is this character's relationship to our other characters? Does this character impact other characters intimately? Not only does the character's death create new pathways in the plot or new obstacles, but does their death create an emotional change in another protagonist? Three, how does their death happen? Is it contrived or does it come with a shock, but a believable tension? Is there traumatic elements for other characters witnessing this death? And four, does this character's death change the world and ultimately the overarching plot? Think of Westeros as a whole. After this character dies, is it the same societally or even politically? So I want you to keep these four concepts in mind as we explore Ned Stark's character and ultimately his death. For Ned Stark, in the beginning, we're introduced to a character who's clearly invested into his family. While that's not everything, the relationship that we see established demonstrates his impact to others. Ned has a code of honor that he passes down to his family. While we may disagree with the punishment for the Night's Watch deserter, we do see the contrast in his honor compelling him to be the executioner. This is not something that's established for the characters outside of the Starks. Ned Stark is principled, and this is important in establishing his inner conflict with what honor compels him to do compared to what his moral compass guides him to do. Things like this connect audiences to characters consciously and subconsciously because we all have internal conflicts that we must contend with, and seeing this in others immediately makes them relatable. Ned's relationship with all of his children is on display at one point or another. Arya as she confides in her father honestly and the concessions Ned makes for her to train with Serio Pharrell. Sansa is a bit rebellious due to her fantasy of being queen and her unrealistic perspective of Joffrey. But when Ned is taken prisoner, her boldness to plea with Joffrey for her father demonstrates her love for her father and even defending Ned to Cersei assuming Ned was manipulated but could never be guilty of deliberate treason. In a small moment with Bran, establishing that Ned cares deeply that Bran is prepared for the reality of the world as he brings Bran along to execute the Night's Watch deserter. Even though brief, Ned's farewell to Jon is touching, but what really demonstrates Ned's impact on Jon is later as Jon is conflicted by the choices he makes and the honorable choices he ponders that his father would make. And what I really think is understated is the impact on Rob. If you go back to season one, I think you'd be surprised by how few scenes they actually share, but they actually share no one-on-one -on -one dialogue scenes. But before and after Ned's death, you can see the code of honor carry over from Ned to Rob. Specifically, I look at how Asha, the wildling, is treated at Winterfell by Rob's command. There's actually more similarities, but we're on limited time. And last but not least, the Ned and Catelyn relationship. While not wildly passionate, compared to a marriage like Robert and Cersei, there's certainly more of a loving marriage present than what we see in many other marriages that are strictly out of duty in this world. Now try to keep these relationships in the back of your mind because we are going to swing back to them. But 
Right now, we're going to take a bit of a tone shift here, because after all, the core of this discussion is the death of Ned's character. Sir Illyn, bring me his head. We need to pay attention to how Ned dies and why it was so impactful. Leading up to Ned's death, we have multiple moments that establish an expectation. The conversation Ned has with Varys makes Ned go against the truth and arguably he's forced to publicly claim he's been dishonorable. While this seems like a defeat in itself, this is consistent with prior moments. When Ned discovers the truth about Cersei's children, he's in a similar situation where he has a choice that keeps him conflicted about what is the right thing to do. And while he aligns himself with Littlefinger to bribe the City Watch, even though this is not exactly what Ned finds honorable, he's forced to choose this path or ignore the truth that he believes, which is that Stannis should become king. But ultimately, Ned is betrayed by Littlefinger. Similarly, Ned changes the wording of Robert's final wishes that his son and heir comes of age. Yet this letter is shredded up by Cersei when he presents it. Ultimately, Ned casts aside his honor because he doesn't want Rob to continue his march against King's Landing and continue the war, and he fears for the safety of Sansa. The defeat and punishment seem to be that Ned will be sent to the Wall, and this idea creates narrative expectations for the audience and questions about the future of Sansa and the rest of his house, plus a curiosity of what Ned's life would look like at the Wall with Jon. So once Ned proclaims his guilt and Joffrey begins speaking to the requests of his mother, Cersei, and Sansa, most audiences were sold, especially at this smile Sansa gives Joffrey. We have Arya watching on confused and scared, and unlike everyone else, Arya is clueless about what is even happening. We see Sansa panic and beg and plea. Even Varys and Cersei try to plea with Joffrey. Yorn grabs Arya to shield her from watching, and because plot armor always saves the protagonist in many stories, audiences are tense, but they're really just trying to figure out what is the thing that will save Ned. Maybe Joffrey stops and this was just his cruelty teasing us. Or maybe Rob's army. No, that wouldn't make sense because they are way too far off. Maybe someone, anyone will run up and stop ill in pain. But before the audience can even really process that there is nothing that can save Ned, this happens. As unexpected and shocking as possible, episode 9 of season 1 of Game of Thrones ends with Ned's death. But because we didn't actually see it, you might actually believe somehow what looked like Ned's death actually did not happen. After all, you don't kill the main character in season one. But we do find out the truth for certain in episode 10. Ned is dead. And Westeros immediately becomes a very different world for our audience. Every single character that has a connection to Ned is given a moment to express the impact of this moment. And what makes these moments impactful is that the relationships that they had with Ned were already explored or implicitly explored. We see how surreal the moment is as Yorn whisks Arya away, so her experience is confusing and disorienting. And she's a young child who may not have the capacity to truly grasp the weight of what just happened. Sansa faints at the scene, but later we see her character's innocence and naivety deteriorate before our eyes as Joffrey forces her to look upon her father's decapitated head. Her worldview has been turned upside down. Jon's inner conflict emerges as he tries to flee the Night's Watch and join his brother's army, only to find himself at a crossroads as his brothers in black recite the Night's Watch vows. It is the vow, it is the honor that he inherits from Ned that conflicts him almost ironically, but it's the vengeance he seeks for Ned fighting against the honor of his vows to the Night's Watch, an organization his father has told him that there is great honor in serving. Maester Lewin is visibly distraught, breaking the news to Bran. And even Rickon, who experienced some form of dream or vision, who believes he saw his father in the crypts at Winterfell. While this scene is not as explorative as it is for the other characters, it is a great example of Game of Thrones following the source material and leaving no stone unturned. Ned's death impacts all of our primary characters in Westeros. Rob and Catelyn are arguably the most impactful narratively or plot-wise for the Starks. 
and the show is certain to give us the experience of their grief. I'd say it's between Rob and Catalan or Sansa that emotionally the audience can really feel the weight of loss and despair, plus the change for the characters as well as the story. Actress Michelle Fairley's somber expression as she walks through the Stark's army camp. I remember my first watch of this scene when we could only see the back of Catalan's head and the army in the background and wondering if she knows about Ned's death. Her acting in this moment is obvious without a word and it is brilliant, as well as the Stark's theme slash score playing over the scene. Then we see Rob as he has arbitrarily chosen a tree to strike repeatedly to express his grief. Rob! You've ruined your sword! That's one of my favorite lines, and it's a real moment. Sometimes death and grief leave us limited in our focus to point out such a benign thing such as a damaged sword. Now equally as important as the emotional impact, Ned's death changes the world in a lot of ways. The North ultimately has no reason to be anything but hostile towards the Lannisters and Joffrey, and while debating which side to join, this is when Jon Umber anoints Rob King of the North. Narratively, whatever the audience thought this story was going to be before Ned died, that idea was turned upside down and shaken into a million disorienting pieces. Now the Starks are stuck in a war they cannot abandon, which ultimately has left the North vulnerable to the Ironborn in Season 2. The Riverlands are caught in the middle and now this war is certain to expand beyond just a few battles, and they'll have no choice but to align themselves with Rob's army. And for the Lannisters, the prospect of diplomacy is out of the window. Perhaps we should sue for peace. There's your peace. Joffrey saw to that when he decided to remove Ned Stark's head. This is important. Tyrion recognizes that a full-fledged war is inevitable. Jaime is held captive by an army whose liege lord was just decapitated by your king. And meanwhile, there's two armies forming in the south between Stannis and Renly. With the north pursuing you further and further south, the Lannisters are in a very understated disadvantage here. And Tywin Lannister rightfully recognizes that killing Ned Stark was a huge mistake because now instead of bringing together a host to defend King's Landing from Stannis or Renly, they're too vulnerable to totally abandon the Riverlands. So in the show, Tywin chooses to regroup his forces at Harrenhal, and this ultimately places Tyrion in King's Landing to serve as Hand of the King. The reason killing Ned was so effective is because it hits the audience with so much emotional weight, but it is not cheap because it also serves the plot. But even more so, it actually reshapes the plot for multiple characters. If it was handled any other way in the form of developing Ned's character, developing Ned's relationships, if any of those emotional pathways were absent, this moment wouldn't be nearly as significant. The emotional and plot purposes both complement each other very well. The plot would certainly still be interesting, but without establishing an emotional impact before Ned's death or moving on from the emotional impact after his death, the plot would feel very shallow compared to what we got. Catelyn carries Ned with her throughout the rest of her time in the story. Not to bring up the book, but I will say Ned Stark is very much present with her inner monologue right up until her death. And the same is true for the rest of your POV characters, especially Jon's character once he becomes intertwined with Ygritte and the Wildlings. Death has to matter in your story. It needs to serve the plot, but just as importantly, it needs to be felt by the surviving characters and your audience. And Ned Stark's death did that perfectly in Game of Thrones. Now, if you'd like me to make similar videos for other character deaths, please let me know in the comments or by liking this video. And if you'd like to support the future of this channel, consider becoming a member here on YouTube or on Patreon. You can click the links in the description. You will receive express credit in future videos, plus exclusive content. But as always, you can simply support the channel by subscribing or watching more Game of Thrones content just like this right here.